Well, hello everyone. This is Byron King coming to you from PDAC uh, in Toronto, the 2022 version uh, with Investor Intel. This is our rare earth panel and we have four terrific uh, gentlemen who truly know the industry from the inside out. They, they work and they operate in uh, uh, mineral deposits and in, this, in the rare earth space and they are just gems of companies and really, uh, really have what they really know what they're doing. Uh, we're going to start off just to introduce our people. We have Jeff Atkins with Vital Metals. Jeff just flew in from Australia, and boy, are his arms tired. No, that's a terrible joke, but no, he really did just fly in. It took the, the red eye or whatever you call it to get halfway around the world to be here, and we are grateful to that. We have Don Gubar, a longtime player in the rare space, Avalon uh, Advanced Materials. To my right, I have Greg. Andrews of uh, uh, Search Minerals in Newfoundland, Labrador, a uh, very fascinating deposit up there. And Fred Kozak, uh, to my far right, Appia uh, Rare Earths and Uranium, way up in uh, the top of Saskatchewan, uh, with one of the most intriguing deposits. Thank you guys for being here. It's really a pleasure to have, it's not just, I've spoken with all of you on an other investor intels. It's terrific to have everybody together. Uh, and, and so here we are. Uh, one of the questions that, that I've had from a lot of readers and just people out there, you know, just out, not, they're, they're not miners, they're not mineral economists, uh, they're not industrial engineers, but this is a very basic question. Uh, they, they, people write into me, they email and say, Byron, you know, the president says we're going to have electric cars by 2030 or 35, and General Motors says we're going to be all electric by this. And, you know, th that's a lot of cars, that's a lot of millions of cars. Do we have enough metal out there to, to meet that demand? Uh, uh, since you came all the way from Australia, what, what, do the, what do you think from your perch way down in Australia? Um, look, it's an interesting one. I think the big, the big thing which I think has happened with the, the electric vehicle industry is we're actually moving away from, I believe, uh, government-driven and legislative-driven um, demand. Where we're really moving now is actually consumer demand. And I think I recently was up in, uh, up in Norway and through Scandinavia, and it's pretty obvious that that's the future of, uh, of motoring, where up there, you know, 90 percent of the vehicles are either electrified or plug-in hybrids or something like that. And whilst there is a government drive for it, that's largely actually driven by consumers. So that's the reality: is we are moving far more towards that electrification of the vehicles. The interesting thing is, though, as you say about um, the availability of, of the metals. Things like rare earths are used in many, many parts of the vehicle. So what you're actually seeing, and you're already seeing it in cars at the moment, you're seeing it in, super, in superconductors and all of those sort of industries where there are shortages in the supply chains where the vehicle manufacturers are actually just prioritising the, the elements of the vehicle which are using those materials. So you're seeing from the superconductor side of things, car manufacturers removing certain options from their from their vehicles like autonomous driving things like that um, and one of the things I found really interesting when I was in Norway was the vehicle we had there was an electric vehicle but seats were all manual steering columns manual mirrors all of those sort of things so it, that's where I think with, if there's a shortage it may not necessarily be from a drive perspective but what you might then see is car manufacturers actually prioritizing the use of those of those elements. Yeah, that's very interesting. Don, do you have uh, do you have an addition to that? Well I agree with what Jeff is saying and um, I've been more focused on the battery materials uh, lately and it's all about creating the capacity on the processing to make the derivative products to meet the needs of the market. It's the same thing with uh, rare earths. Well, let's 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 pick that up because in terms of uh, mineral deposits in the ground, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, move to, to to my right here. The audience is left. Uh, we're looking at two between the two of you. You both have extremely uh, fascinating, geologically important uh, rare earth deposits, and uh, the the question would be, you know, what what. What's the mineability and what's the what's the flow chart look like from you know rocks in the ground to something that you know, the people can start installing in a battery or the traction motor? The great thing about the Appia deposit is what we have found so far is all on surface. Uh, we've talked initially about uh, the very high grade rare earths that we found. We found literally 
not just nuggets, but massive intrusions of monazite, which are highly concentrated for rares, on surface. And so our initial thinking is we may be able to just quarry it as opposed to having to build a large open pit mine, that sort of thing. Uh, we're just drilling right now a second uh, discovery on surface. Looks to be, well, wait for the assays. Uh, but it is on surface, it's 300 meters in strike length, 175 meters wide. Uh, we drilled down depth to 100 meters and we're still finding it. So from our perspective, it's a phenomenal uh, discovery at Alsace Lake where it's mostly on surface and then 27 square kilometers of high grade mineralization also on surface. So Mother Nature's being very kind to us mm -hmm. so far. So high grade ore. Now Greg, with your deposit at Search, you have a different geology but you also have a, a, a downstream play in terms of you know, what you're going to do with the, with the rocks and minerals once you pull them out. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, so yeah, we're blessed also having our um, deposit on surface, but we have a 63 kilometer district and we just published RPA that did the economics on two of our resources, the Fox Rod and Deep Fox, which give us a 26 year mine life at 2,000 tons per day. So we're, we're excited about that. And further on, what we've done with our, with our deposit is we are looking at doing primary processing in Labrador that would produce about four to four and a half percent concentrate that could be shipped to the island of Newfoundland for the further processing of our proven technolo or technology of direct extraction and moving on to solvent extraction. So you, you have, uh, in the sense that you're, you're running not just a mines and minerals play, you have a downstream uh, uh, business approach as well. Well, it's, it, we're looking at that, but and you know what we're looking at with the primary being able to produce that concentrate on site, mm -hmm. and that just reduces the volume so it can be shipped to the island. And, and so we'll be looking at that, and then creating the continuing with our pilot plant work and demonstration plant. That's our next field for our demo, direct extraction, mm -hmm. so that we can produce that high. Uh, value carbonate for further separation. I see. Well, let's, let, and let's, let's pick that ball up and run with it. Jeff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run it back with you here. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about ore deposits and grade. We've talked about mine and mineability. We're, get, we're to the point of concentrating it. But can you give us and give the viewers out there, uh, what is the current status of, let's call it the non-Chinese uh, ability to do those intermediate steps in the downstream so that we can get to where the battery makers have what they need and the motor makers need. What's, what's, the, what's the state of that art right now? Um, very short is, is, the, is the short answer. So the challenge you have, and this is where uh, rare earth motors is very different to the batteries. So from a battery perspective, you have your lithium, you know, produce either a lapetalite or a spodumene, go straight into a lithium hydroxide, which goes into the battery. So it's a relatively short step. The challenge you've got for rare earths is you have the mine, concentration, extraction, separation, metallization, alloying, magnet manufacturing, motor manufacturing before it goes into the car. So there's a lot more steps there. And the problem for the what you might call the non-China supply chain is metal manufacturing really doesn't make a lot of money, if anything. And you also need volume for that. Um, from a magnet perspective, you need to have a license. And you either have a license with Hitachi or a license with uh, Neo Materials. And that's basically the bottle. So they are the key bottlenecks there. So there is a long process which needs to be taken. And the final thing I'll add is it all comes down to qualification. So it's not just about resources in the ground, it's actually proving the ability to be able to produce the product at the specifications. Because unfortunately, you, you know, the specifications are very tight. Rare earths, are, they're not a, it's not a, a mining product, it's a chemical product, and you need to treat it that way. So what that means is it's not like a iron ore project where you just build a massive project and you know you can sell it. What you need to do is you need to actually match the, the, what the customers are able to accept, and unfortunately they won't accept the product, regardless of demand, unless it's qualified. And that will take two to three years. So that, that's where the real challenge comes in. And that's one reason why you end up with these very, this very long time to market to actually build up these supply chains because you do have to take it one step at a time. Yeah, I mean, and it's something that I, I think a lot of people who followed the space have heard the story, you know, China controls everything, you know, China had 95% or 92%, you know, whatever the number is and what have you. And, uh, but, 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 but all those, it, China has an entire 
industrial space devoted to this. They have universities that turn out engines. It, it's a full ecosystem. Yeah, it's a full ecosystem. Yeah. It and, and, and it also, the, the, the industry is so well established over, over there as well that it also has the economies of scale. So what you're seeing in Europe, North America, is actually trying to build that ecosystem up from first principles. And that will always take time. We'll get there, but it will take, it will take time. Don, add, add, add some more to this. You've been, you've been doing this for many years. You're an absolute scholar in this subject. You know, tell, give, give the viewers uh, some of your perspective on that. Well, the main reason that China got control of rare earths and other critical mineral supply chains was because they saw before anyone in the West did on how you have to create the downstream manufacturing and processing capacity in order to justify creating the primary supply. And that's a foreign concept to the traditional mining industry here in Canada and in the U.S. And so we've got to basically start to encourage more of the R&D on innovative ways to use rare earths, especially the heavy rare earths. Our resource at Mechilacho was had a high proportion of heavy rare earths, and at the time there was no real potential supply of heavy rare earths. But there's still a lot more work to be done on the R&D to see how they can take advantage of those unique properties of the heavy rare earths in more and more new technologies and then create more and more supply. But you've got to create the demand before you can create much of the supply. Okay, thank, thank you, Don. And now in terms of supply and demand, let's get back to some of the basics. Uh, Fred, let's go with you and, your, and the monazite deposit that you have with Appia rare earths and, and uranium. Uh, as a as a as a standalone deposit, I mean, where where do you go where do you go with that in terms of you know of, of, of feeding it into a an ecosystem that isn't fully developed? How does that how does that work? Well, one of the attractions of being in Saskatchewan, and Jeff knows this from what uh, Vital is doing, um, is the Saskatchewan Research Council is building a rare earth processing facility in Saskatoon. Uh, it's meant to be up and operating uh, first quarter of 2023 partial and then remainder up and operating in 2024. So uh, the attraction for us, as opposed to having to ship it to China, for example, for processing, we're going to ship our, uh, our monazite straight down to Saskatoon. Uh, you know, it's a very, very short distance and you know, capture some of the some of the economics, I suppose, in terms of having a lesser, you know, an inexpensive or what looks to be an inexpensive project to extract, mm -hmm. and then uh, a processing facility that's in our home province and just down the road. Mm -hmm. and, and Craig, what, what, tell us about the search uh, approach to that as well. Yeah, well, I, I agree with what Jeff's saying. Is you know, we all of us here, we're, we're trying to create a rare earth industry in Canada that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And from that, we need, you know, the resources. When, we, when uh, Don talks about education is, we don't, the, the universities and we're not doing R&D because we don't have access to product. And, and so we'll be able to, you know, as we create our industry, we should be able to grow and, and learn what other minerals and um, the uses of rare earths can come from that. So that's what we're excited about. And, you know, so from moving, moving and being able to create something in Canada that doesn't exist, is, I think, a fantastic opportunity that we can capture in this moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jeff, again, using excuse me, your, uh, your Australian perspective, but you're also, you deal in North, with North America and you deal with the European Union. Uh, when all you have to do is, is read a little bit of the newspaper, an old fashioned concept of newspapers, but I mean, read a little bit of the news online or whatever, to realize that, that the world trade system is breaking down, you know, that China as the supplier of everything is not going to work. Uh, can you discuss a little more about, you know, how is this ecosystem going to evolve? How do we, how do we nurture it or what, what has to happen? Look, I think it basically the, the, the key drivers have to be the end users. So the end users have to be the ones who want to diversify their supply chain. And I think one of the big triggers at the moment when you look at a global supply chain is what's happening in, the, U in um, the Ukraine and Russia, where you're looking at the impact there on things like fertilizer prices and the disruptions to supply chains through that. And I think the fertilizer, I think Ukraine supplies something like 20%, and that's having a massive impact on global markets. You then have a look at issues in the 
general shipping supply chains and minor upsets to the supply chains are having big impacts all around the world. And I think that's where the, the key drivers come for the need to diversify the supply chain and, and mitigate your risk. And that's got to come from the end users. So to me, the key driver is going to be when the end users decide that it's actually worth their while to diversify their, their risk, secure sources from other parts, and are actually willing to pay for that and pay for that reduced risk. And when you say end users, do you, you know, do you mean the General Motors of the I'm, world? I mean the, 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 Ford, car, the, the car manufacturers. You know, the, the car makers, the aerospace people that use, exactly. the, use the materials. Yeah. Because the other thing you have to remember as well is car manufacturers in general have been dealing in commodities. So all the products which they put into a car are generally commodities. So from an engine perspective, they're supplying, they're, you know, they're buying ingots, which they're casting. When you start looking at an electric motor or a battery, it's a completely different beast. And you're looking at something which might have a lead time of nine months versus something which, when they're used to dealing in just in time. So it's a complete change in, the, um, in inventory management, supply chain management, and that's not something which can happen overnight. So I think we are starting to see some of those changes, and, but it will take time. Well, Don, you have been doing this. I, I met you, I don't know, I think 12 or 13 years ago and in the rare earth context, and, we've been, and we, we had a big rare earth run up you know, 10, 12 years ago, and, and a big rare earth run up, a big rare earth run down. Have, have, have investors, has the industry, have, have people learned anything in the last 10 years? Uh, and again, you, you mentioned that you deal with the battery space. I mean, talk about, talk about, talk about, have people learned anything? And you know, what's, what's the impact going to be to the, to the battery side of, of powering a car? Well, they're starting to learn a little bit more about it, but it's taken a while to get the general public, especially government, educated on what it takes to create these supply chains in these non-traditional commodities. And as Jeff said, it's all about having the end users create the demand and start to support creating that supply of the materials that they need in the various new technologies like electric vehicles. And they're starting to think about that. I know some of the major EV manufacturers in North America are talking about investing in the upstream on the battery material side. So that could well happen with uh, rare earths as well. Well, we are about out of time, and I want to thank everyone for participating. I want to thank the audience out there who watches this uh, for watching. Uh, what I think we're hearing, and you know, this is just sort of inferring from around, that, that this is still quite a niche of uh, you know market sector, but when the wheel turns, it's going to turn rapidly in the sense that if something bad happens with China, something bad happens with just globalization in general, uh, people, a lot of people, a lot of these so-called end users are going to be looking around in a hurry saying, hey, where's my non-Chinese source of supply? Where's my non-Chinese uh, supply chain? You know, where are the universities that turn out the chemical engineers and the metallurgical engineers? We're, you know, and we're going to see a lot of things happen in a real, real hurry, including uh, a, a real, uh, you might say, rush to uh, investing in companies that have been, let's say, underinvested in, uh, so, and uh, some of these, some of the rare earth plays, we have some right here, are terrific companies, beautiful management, beautiful deposits, uh, and terrific futures. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for watching. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.